Salvites sodales de natura fabulosa disputantes. Valde gaudeo, quod vos via digitali tantum, his temporibus alloqui, vobis cumque colloquia interitialia habere possum. Ea colloquia erunt de praeteritis et de praesentibus, et de praeteritis cum praesentibus conjunctis. Mains antiqua manet, the mind of old remains, of its metamorphosis to 485, humanized animals in of its metamorphoses and contemporary children's and young adults' literature. I would like to present to you of it as Praeceptor Naturae Fabulosa. Ovid's main opus, Metamorphoses, provides an encyclopedic mythology with the wide chronological range from the creation of the world until the poet's own time and even his afterlife, we won, is the last word of the epic poem. In this poem, Ovid tells about 250 single stories, carmina, deducta, interwoven, intertexta, in a fine and learned narratological construction of 15 books in epic hexameters, his Carmen Perpetuum. The motive of changing forms, mutatae formae, in Greek metamorphoses, functions as a unifying principle in Ovid's narrative and quasi-philosophical cosmos of everlasting change. His narrator Pythagoras in the last book says, Everything is changed, nothing gets lost. Omnia mutantur, nil interit. Metamorphosis is the dominant quality of Ovid's concept of, as I like to suppose, mythical nature, natura fabulosa, presented as the creation of the manufacturer of the world, Mundi Fabricator, in Metamorphosis 155, marked by continuous processes of change and brought in a stable and lasting literary form only by the ingenious poet of change. The motto Naturamque Novat and Nature is renewed by him in Metamorphosis 8, 189, characterizes not only Daedalus' hubristic and hazardous invention of artificially winged human beings flying like birds, so that he, Daedalus, imitates real birds, ut veras imitator aves in Metamorphosis 8, 195. It is also a metapoetic statement about the arch-inventor of it himself. In his poem of change, the nature of things, rerum natura, is constantly changed, since the physical borders marked by elements and organisms become characteristically fluid whenever a process of change of forms is described and staged within the poem. Here we can see the result of Icarus' inadequate attempt to imitate a bird. Most changes of form in Ovid's strongly ideological poem are physical, that is, natural metamorphoses. They illustrate a transition from one form to a different one. In most cases, a human being is transformed into an element of the botanic, animal, mineral or astral nature. Transitions from inanimate beings into animate ones, stones to human beings, occur much less often than transitions from animate beings, human beings, into different animate beings, animals, or inanimate ones, stones. The metamorphosis has physical and psychological aspects. There are complete as well as partial metamorphoses. The direction of the metamorphoses can be presented as degradation or ascension. Now I like to present examples of paradoxical change of nature, unchanged minds in new bodies in Ovid. First example, Io, Metamorphosis 1, 635 to 641. 
Io is transformed into a cow by her lover Jupiter, who thus tries to conceal his adulterous love affair from his jealous wife Juno. See especially Metamorphosis 1, 636-7. And as she tried Io to complain, a mooing came out of her mouth, and she was afraid of the sounds and was terrified by her personal voice. Et conata query mugitus editit ora per timuitque sonos propriaque exterrita vocest. Second example, Callisto is transformed into a she-bear as a punishment by the jealous Juno again, whose husband Jupiter has transformed himself into Diana in order to rape the virgin Callisto. The narrator says, the ability to speak is taken away, a voice enraged and threatening and full of terror is uttered out of the rough throat. The mind, however, as it was from old, is preserved even in the new made she bear. Posse loquie ripitur, vox iracunda minaxque plenaque terroris rauco de gotto refertur. Means antiqua tamen, facta quoque mansit in ursa. Third example, Actaeon is transformed into a deer as a punishment by the virgin goddess Diana, whom the hunter Actaeon by accident saw in the nude when she was bathing in a cave with a natural fountain. Locus Amunus becomes a locus in Amunus for Actaeon. Poor me, he was to say, voice of no kind has come out. He groans. The voice was this, and tears dropped down the face that was not his. Only the mind of before is preserved. Me miserum dicturus erat, vox nulla secutast. Ingemuit, vox illa fuit, lacrimaeque per ora non sua fluxerunt. Main stantum pristina mansit. Fourth example, Macarius, in the fourteenth book of Abbot's Metamorphosis, is transformed into a pig by the divine sorcerer Circe, but rescued by his comrade Ulysses and fortunately retransformed into a human being and finally into one of Ovid's narrators, telling the Circe story as a first-hand account about his metamorphosis and transformation into a pig now. I am ashamed and I will tell it. I started to get bristles and hard skin and to lose my ability to speak and instead of words to utter a rough mumbling and to go down to the earth with my whole face. It put it at referam, saitis rescara coipi, nec jam posse loqui, pro herbis eder raucum murmur et interam toto procumbere vultu. Of its model and architect for all these partial metamorphoses of human beings into animals is as often Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus himself tells the Phaeacians about his travels and about his trip also to Circe, where many of his comrades and companions were transformed into pigs, and Ulysses, Odysseus, says, But like of pigs were their heads and hairs and their builds, 
but their minds remained intact as they were before. Hoi de Sion min ikon ke palas bonin te tricast kai limas audar nuis in impidus hos tu parus per. And here we see Waterhouse's Circe offering the cup to Eudysseus, whom we say see only in the mirror approaching, but having moly and a sword with him, so that he is not transformed into a pig. Human minds and voices in animal bodies we can also find in contemporary children's and young adults literature. Uh, one very good, let's say e extremely funny and extremely ingenious example is presented by Paul Shipton's The Pig Scrolls by Grillus the Pig. The name Grillus is of course taken by Plutarch and his account and dialogue of the former companion of Odysseus, Grillus. Paul Shipton's Grillus the Pig as an Ovidian hybrid creature combining Phaethon's thirst for solar action, as presented in Metamorphosis 2, with Macarius' build and voice. In Shipton's The Pig Scrolls, the cunning and Odysseus-like pig Grillus is one of the companions of Odysseus, a rower who was transformed into a pig by Circe. Like the boisterous Phaethon in Ovid, he takes the chariot of Helios' soul. But unlike Phaethon, Grillus, despite all difficulties and the reluctance of the horses, never loses control over the chariot. Thus the sun, which is here seen equal to the element fire, manages to solder a dangerous crack in the earth which was caused by the destructive force of Chaos. The initial Chaos, also of Ovid's Metamorphoses. The ether here turns out to be not a zone of defeat and catastrophe as in Ovid's Fath and Myth, but as a zone of triumph. Ovid's deep interest in psychology is maintained in Shipton's post-text, but the tragic aspects are tempered by irony with regard to the final success of Grillus's mission. Phaethon's hubris is replaced by Grillus's altruistic motives. The chariot was pulling a bit to the left. I adjusted the reins so that we were heading directly toward the giant drip in the sky. A couple of the fairy horses whinnied their disapproval. They didn't want to go that way, and who could blame them? But I managed to hold our course. The reins burned and smoked as they dug into my mouth, but I refused to let go. The heat was getting unbearable, and the sweet smell of roasting pork filled my snout. Not much longer, and there'd be nothing left of me but a mound of lard and a pile of barbecued ribs. It was like being roasted on a spit, but I willed myself not to drop the reins. I was a pig on a mission. To distract myself from the terrible heat and the pain, I began to sing aloud, forcing the words past the reins and out the side of my mouth. There once was a pig in the sky, so hot he was starting to fry. Even my voice seemed to crack and bubble in the chariot's blazing fire. But not far to go now. We were so close I could see nothing but a swirling dance of non nothingness looming in front of me. At the last moment I pulled the reins sharply to the left so that the blazing horses were now flying straight across the rip in the world. The turn was so tight that the chariot of the sun swung wide directly toward the chaos from which the cosmos had risen. I continued my song. He wanted to live. He had so much to give. Apart from the ubiquitous irony and strong humour of the human pig Grillus, almost physically fried by heat of the burning sun chariot, there is also more hope than in most of Ovid's stories about animals with human minds and human emotions. The pig Grillus has never lost its mighty human voice. Although it is disturbed by smoke and fire, 
He can even sing to cope with a moment of catastrophic danger for the whole universe. Ovid's poem of Transformations confronts us with human beings exposed to the arbitrary punishment inflicted on them by anthropomorphic deities. With the exception of the fortunate Macarius, human minds and especially human voices like that of Io, Callisto and Actaeon captured and eternally enclosed in an alien animal body, particularly in the cases of Io and Callisto, completely contrary to their peaceful and innocent manners. Especially in Macaria's case, the voices of the transformed and here retransformed human bodies are metamorphosized in narrator's voices within the epic poem on nature and natures. So Ovid's Natura Fabulosa is an inspiring and often bewildering cosmos of changes in nature and changes of nature. And thus these voices will live forever. Ergo vivant voces. Vivat et Ovidius, poeta naturae fabulosae. Gratias vobis ago maximas. <laughs>